It's been an amazing day already, hasn't it? I mean, I'm so thrilled by all God's doing at Grace Church. And I want to shout out uh, our our worship team. I'm really grateful for Kelby Dixon and the ways he's led our team to to lead and worship. It's just, yeah, I, I told him between services, thank you for getting me ready to preach. Thank you for our people turning their ears to God and being ready for God's words. Powerful thing. This week was weird. Was it weird for you? I mean, Wednesday, I, I didn't know what to do. Um, I, I was looking out my office window at our incredible, beautiful property where usually I see deer and you know, geese and even a fox back there. But on Wednesday, all I could see was smoke. It looked kind of yellow, the whole thing. And that really got my attention. And I uh, dug out that word that we don't want to say that starts with an M, my mask. And I put it on on the way home, and I I didn't know this, but it turns out that the Lehigh Valley was actually the worst. It was ground zero for the most impacted area. I mean, that's the picture of our stacks. It's a little crazy and apocalyptic, isn't it? I mean, that's crazy. That night I did my research, and I didn't realize how serious the fires in Canada were. So that led me to pray for the firefighters and for people whose places were being affected. But I also didn't realize that it was the combination of the smoke and just the right wind pattern. It was really a perfect storm for the dangerous air condition that it created. But thank goodness, right? The smog lifted two days later. I wonder, have you ever had a change? Have you ever had a darkness come over your life? But it wouldn't lift. Over the next few weeks, we're looking at this parable, the parable of the the prodigal son. It's called Coming Home. And today we're putting the focus on the younger brother, and he had literally a cloud over his life. He had darkness over his life. And what we're going to read as we read the parable is that it only gets darker. See, he knew that his choice to ask for his inheritance before his father died was out of line. And he knew that the consequences were going to be serious, but he did it anyway. Here's how this parable, this famous parable that Jesus taught, here's how it starts. There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set out for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. We learn from the story that the father had two sons, and the first one we learn about is the younger brother. Now, I don't know where you are in birth order, and today, as you know, I'm one of six kids, and today I'm very happy to have sibling number five here, Mandy, at the front. Y'all welcome my sister. When you have so many, I'm not sure how this birth order thing works, but wherever you are, this younger brother kind of fulfilled every birth order idea that's out there. He was the baby. He may not have had a baby book, right? But he expects a lot. Perhaps he was a bit entitled, used to getting what he wants. And this younger son did the unthinkable. He asked the father for his part of the inheritance. Now, in that culture, in Middle Eastern culture, that meant that the younger son can't wait for his dad to die. The son doesn't want the father, but he wants the father's stuff. According to Jewish law, he was, as a younger brother, entitled to one third of the father's stuff. And he decided that he wanted it now. 
Now remember, Jesus is telling this story to the Pharisees and religious people and to the sinners and the tax collectors. But both groups of people had the same reaction. They were shocked. They couldn't believe it. No one asked for this. Any Middle Eastern patriarch, it would be perfectly fine for him to have slapped this younger son and sent him away and banished him from from the family forever. It was shocking that he asked. But even more shocking was the father's response. I'm sure the Pharisees and the tax collectors were saying, oh, we know how this story's gonna end. But it didn't end the way they thought. The father said, yes. Even though he knew his son would fail, even though it broke his heart, The father agrees and he begins to break up the family estate. He puts the for sale sign up and the neighbors can't believe it. Rumors start flying. Is it true that this son is selling the land that has been in the family for generations? And so when the story says that not long after that, the son leaves, we get it. He was, he, he was an embarrassment to his family. He was an embarrassment to his community. And he needed to leave quickly. So he takes his money and he runs. Not only was he an embarrassment, he was a disgrace to his father. His son is going as far away from his family as he can, as far away from his faith as he can. Now in the story, we don't really know everything that happened in the distant country. But that that word, that Greek word that translates wild, it, it really means extravagant. He's living extravagantly, he's living large. It means he goes through his money really fast and then he doesn't have any money. It's so bad. It's so bad that he even has to find a job, a despicable job. Because at the same time he's spending his money, the economy is also tanking where he is. So the only job he can find is feeding the pigs. I mean, he is about as far away from his former life as he possibly could be. We told you last week that every week we're gonna present you with an art piece that reflects this incredible story because artists for generations have been trying to to get to the heart of this. It's a powerful story. And today's painting is from an English painter uh, by the name of John McCallan Swan. And he actually made his mark, the apex of his career was this painting. He was known for two things. First, he was known for the ways that he depicted human figures and how when you looked at his painting, you, you could feel the emotion but probably he was most famous for his painting of wild animals. So if you look close, you're gonna see lions and tigers and bears. Oh my, not not really. You're gonna see pigs and you're gonna see cows. But doesn't that image tell a story? Tells a story. We don't see his face, but we can actually experience his despair. He's surrounded by pigs, which Jewish people weren't supposed to be around. And he's all alone. I mean, what a fall from the overconfident, loaded, adventurous, rebellious son he was at the beginning. Have you ever been at a low like this? Maybe you still are. You have no margin. You have no way out. You have nobody around you. But in this moment of despair, the son remembers the father. And here's how the rest of the story goes. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I'll set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like 
one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Don't you love all the details of Jesus' story? He says the son came to his senses. Now when you read that, it, it, it's easy to mistake what it really means. It's hard to know what he means. Was he really sorry? Well, not exactly. He, he wasn't really returning to apologize. He, he was returning asking something else from his father. This time it was a job. He knew that he could never have gotten forgiveness. He knew he could never be a son again. He knew that coming home was not even a possibility. His plan was an economic solution, not a change of heart. See, he doesn't say, what have I done to you, Father? I'm ashamed of myself. I, I broke your heart. He says, my father's workers eat better than I do. He hopes his father will give him a job so he can eat. And he also hopes that maybe, just maybe, with this job, he could pay back some of the mo money that he's blown. But there's even a problem getting back to the father. The son knew what was waiting on him. Kenneth Bailey is this Presbyterian New Testament scholar and he spent 40 years in the Middle East as a missionary and he's now with Jesus, but he describes what would have happened to him. Every Jewish son would have known this. If you lost your inheritance and tried to come back to the village, the town elders would meet you and they would meet you with the Hazaza ceremony. The Hazaza ceremony, it would, uh, what they would do is they would confront him with a, a large clay pot full of burnt corn and nuts. And they would take it and they would throw it down in front of him and say, you are cut off from your people. They would ban him from co ever coming back to the village and in fact, according to that ceremony, they could even kill him. So imagine what he was experiencing as he got ready to approach his village. He hoped he could find his father before the elders found him. But as he made that last turn, he saw something. He saw someone and they were running towards him. It was a man who had his robe pulled up, which no presentable man would have done. His robe was pulled up so he could run faster. And that was getting everyone's attention and taking attention away from him. Then the son realized it was his father running before anyone else could get to him. And his father embraces him and, and kisses him. The son immediately starts to ask for a job, but the father does so much more than that. He asks his son to come home. Son, you are my son. He doesn't say you're lost and now you've come home. He says, you were lost, but now I, the father, have found you. You were dead and now you're living. Doesn't that sound exactly like those first two stories Jesus told? Like the shepherd going after the sheep and the woman going after that coin. And then finally, the son can repent. The son can say he's sorry, but only because the father has made room for him to say, I'm sorry. He's made room for him to be fully forgiven. It's such a beautiful turnaround. At the beginning of this parable, the son 
declares that his father is dead by taking that money. But at the end of the story, it's the father who pronounces that the son is alive. This parable has a message for prodigals. So if you're far away from God, this is for you. You can't come to the father on your own terms. That son came back and he thought that the very best way to win back a relationship with his father was to present a business plan, a foolproof business plan. I'll pay my dad back for everything. I'll get standing back in the town again. You know, that would be like an Olympic track runner thinking that you could cut across the track to the finish line. Or like a baseball player who caught the ball from the pitcher and then threw it up and hit a home run. I mean, not the rules. Doesn't work that way. Jesus is saying that's not the way it works. The father has already run after you and saved you from what you deserved. He already did for you what you can't do for yourself. See, the father's plan was already set. The son had to put down his plans and just receive the love of the father. He didn't deserve it and he never would. You know, there are so many ways that you can try to manage God. You think you can be a prodigal for your fun years and you'll come back to God when you're ready. You think you can bargain with God because your plan is obviously better than God's. You think you can give God one day a week. I mean, kind of check the box and the rest, eh, they're yours. Or you think you can give God a part of your life but hold back other parts of your life. That's not the way it works. The Father wants all of you. He isn't impressed with your accomplishments. We're gonna see that next week. He isn't afraid of your failures. The Father wants you to let him throw you the party. He wants you to put down your groveling and put down your game plan. He wants you simply to receive his grace. I've used this definition for grace lots of times. I'm so glad our church is called grace. God's riches at Christ's expense. Grace. Have you ever really thought about what it is? You see, Jesus, it's interesting, Jesus got stripped of his robe and went to the cross. And in this story, the father gives a robe so that you could live forever. You see the difference? What a God we serve. If you're a prodigal, here's another message for you. You're always the son or the daughter of the father. You will always be the son or the daughter to the father. If you're a parent, you said it to your child. As a child, you've probably heard your parents say it to you. You will always be my little boy. You will always be my little girl. Even though the father knew that the son would fail, even though the son had embarrassed his dad, even though the son had broken his heart, the father never gave up because he'll always be the son. The father doesn't stop loving. The father doesn't start hoping. The father doesn't stop looking. Years ago, a young man was riding on a train and he had a suitcase uh, under his seat, but that was true for lots of other passengers. But something was different about this, this man. Every few minutes, he would get up from his seat and he would pace the aisle back and forth, back and forth, until he would sit down again. It was obvious that this man had a lot on his mind. See, ever since he was a teenager, he hadn't gotten along with his parents, and that was an understatement. He rebelled in every way possible. 
And finally, after one really rough night of fighting, he announced to his parents that he was leaving. And his dad didn't argue with him. Son, if you walk out that door, don't come back. So he packed his suitcase and he left. Living on his own didn't go so well. He wandered from town to town. He wandered from job to job. He was absolutely miserable. He could barely make ends meet. And one night he was out with some of his buddies and they were drinking and they decided they were going to rob the local liquor store and they got caught and he ended up in jail. At the end of his jail term, he, he decided that he should really write a note to his parents. So he told them everything in the note. He told them about prison. He told them about the mistakes he had made since he left home. He told them he was really sorry for leaving and, and he told them he would understand if they never ever wanted to see him again. But at the end of the letter, he said, I'm leaving jail and on this day, I'm gonna be on a train coming through town. And he knew, of course, that his house was right on the tracks. So he wrote in the letter, if you want to see me, tie something white out on the tree. And if I don't see anything white, I'll just stay on through the next town and you'll never hear from me again. The minutes passed. And it got closer and closer to his town, closer and closer to his parents' verdict. I mean, what if there was nothing white on that tree? As he got closer, he, he pressed his head up against the window looking, could it be, would it be, would there be white on that tree? And he got the surprise of his life. His mom and dad had literally emptied their house of every towel, every washcloth, every bedspread, every piece of white underwear, everything white in their house was out there. And there's never been a quicker response. The son grabbed his suitcase, he jumped off the train car, he dragged that suitcase to, up to the hill to his house and he met his mom and dad who were running to greet him. That is what the father is like. See, if you know the good news of Jesus, if you know the cross, the cross shows us just that. The cross is the ultimate tree. It shows us that the Father wants us to come home no matter what. The Father wants us to come home. See, prodigal in the story meets prodigal. Extravagant living that leads to nowhere meets extravagant loving, which changes everything. See, God so loved the world that he sent Jesus into the world. What allows us to come home is extravagant. It's expensive. See, Jesus had to give his life so that you could live. Jesus gave his life so you get do-over after do-over after do-over. And if you believe that, it changes everything. Now here's a last word for the prodigals. You have to let the father be the father. Hear this. You have to let the father be the father and you have to be the son or the daughter. Let him be your father. Maybe you've seen this tattoo. If you haven't, here's what it means. Look close. God is greater than, it's a little math lesson, greater than, right, than my highs or lows. It was really hard for the son to believe that God's love was bigger than his lows. Do you believe it? God is bigger than your highs. He's bigger than your lows. His love is bigger than your highs or your lowest lows. See, he loves you too much to leave you. He can even take the lowest lows and repurpose those for your good and for his purposes. And he is doing that in our church. And he's doing that in your life. See, Jesus tells this story so that prodigals can hear, God is with you. God is for you, just like the father was for the son. 
See, the Father wants to redeem every bad decision you've made. The Father wants to invite you to forgive yourself. The Father wants to carry the pain that you're not able to carry yet. The Father wants to lead you to people who believe in you. The Father wants to give you experiences where you know his love. He wants to work in every part of your life, every part of your past, every part of your future to bring good. So if you're far away, if you're a prodigal, hear this invitation. He wants you to come home. I love this quote. It says, a man travels the world over in search of what he needs and returns home to find it. I don't care where you've traveled, what you've done, the only place you're gonna find home is with the Father. So are you a prodigal? Are you a younger brother? Did you used to be one? Do you know one? Is your child one? Will we be a church where there is room for the younger brothers? and where we can cheer when the younger brother comes home. You know, the younger brother was right. When he came to the father, he was right because he knew he wasn't worthy. None of us are, so we all are prodigals. But God so loved the prodigals. God so loved me. God so loved you that he sent Jesus into the world. Today, hear this invitation again. Come home. God, you know every heart here. You know every heart listening. You know those that ran away years ago. You know those that are still running. You know those of us who are praying for a prodigal in our own family. By your spirit, would you help each prodigal to know that you are a good, good father. You're running after us to love us. You're ready to hold us. You're ready to bring us home. God, do your work by your spirit to help us to know this truth and help us hear your invitation again to come home to be in your presence, to know you as our true north, the center of our life, the one who knows us fully and loves us fully. We pray it in the name of Jesus who ran after us. Amen.